stand for the shofar sound, the call to worship. Shema Israel, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Baruch Shem Kavod Malkuto Le'olom Vayed. Blessed be the name of the glory of his kingdom forever and ever. Vehafta et Adonai Elohecha bechor levaveka uvkor nafsheka uvkor meldeka. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. Vehayu hadvarim hayala asher anoki mitzavka hayom ala vevecha. And these words which I command you today shall be upon your heart. Vishinantam lavanecha vetebartha bam befshekta beftecha lufteka vederech ufshachbeka ufkameka. You shall teach them thoroughly to your children, and you shall speak of them when you sit in your house and when you walk on the road, when you lie down, and when you rise. Ukshartom leolot al yadeka vehayu letotafot bin inecha. You shall bind them as a sign upon your hand, and they shall be for a reminder between your eyes. Uktavtam el muzazot biteka uv visharecha. And you shall write them upon the doorposts of your house and upon your gate. Blessed are you, O Lord our God, King of the universe, who has sanctified us with your Torah and has given us the light of life in Yeshua our Messiah, the Prince of Peace. And Master of the universe, we the children of Israel and of Abraham by faith, we ask you for Mashiach to redeem us, now and with mercy, from exile and all suffering, to reveal your name in the world and to bring peace. So 
you are doing in us, the things that you're teaching us, what we are learning.
this passage that says, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? But he who has clean hands and a pure heart. And this week's Torah reading is about clean and unclean. And, you know, as, as modern believers in Yeshua, those of us who have been raised in the church, I never heard any teaching about this. I don't know about you guys, but I have never heard any teaching about what is clean and what is unclean and what that means to us today. We've read the passages in the New Testament of the Nassau or the Apostolic Writings that say that, you know, these, these, this, and this will not enter the kingdom. And one of those things on the list is unclean. And I've heard all the teachings about all the other stuff. <laughs>
It is a chronic leprosy on the skin of his body, and the priest shall pronounce him unclean. He shall not isolate him, for he is unclean. And if the leprosy breaks out farther on the skin, and the leprosy covers all the skin of him who has the infection from his head, even to his feet, as far as the priest can see, then the priest shall look, and behold, if the leprosy has covered all his body, he shall pronounce clean him who has the infection. It has all turned white, and he is clean. But whenever raw flesh appears on him, he shall be unclean. And the priest shall look at the raw flesh, and he shall pronounce him unclean. The raw flesh is unclean. It is leprosy. Or if the raw flesh turns again and is changed to white, then he shall come to the priest. And the priest shall look at him, and behold, if the infection has turned to white, then the priest shall pronounce him clean. He who has the infection, he is clean. And when the body has a boil on its skin, and it is healed, and in the place of the boil where is a white swelling or a reddish white, bright spot, then it shall be shown to the priest. And the priest shall look, and behold, if it appears to be lower than the skin, and the hair on it has turned white, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is the infection of leprosy. It has broken out in the boil. But if the priest looks at it, and behold, there are no white hairs in it, and it is not lower than the skin, and is faded, then the priest shall isolate him for seven days. And if it spreads farther on the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is an infection. But if the bright spot remains in its place and does not spread, it is only the scar of the boil, and the priest shall pronounce him clean. Or if the body sustains in its skin a burn by fire, and the raw flesh of the burn becomes a bright spot, reddish white or white, then the priest shall look at it, and if the hair in the bright spot has turned white, and it appears to be deeper than the skin, it is leprosy, it has broken out in the burn. Therefore the priest shall pronounce him unclean, it is an infection of leprosy. But if the priest looks at it, and indeed there is no white hair in the bright spot, and it is no deeper than the skin, but is dim, then the priest shall isolate him for seven days. And the priest shall look at him on the seventh day. If it spreads farther in the skin, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is an infection of leprosy. But if the bright spot remains in its place and has not spread in the skin, but is dim, it is the swelling from the burn. And the priest shall pronounce him clean, for it is only the scar of the burn. Now if a man or woman has an infection on the head or on the beard, then the priest shall look at the infection, and if it appears to be deeper than the skin, and there is a thin yellowish hair in it, and there is thin yellowish hair in it, then the priest shall pronounce him unclean. It is a scale, it is leprosy of the head or of the beard. But if the priest looks at the infection of the scale, and indeed it appears to be no deeper than the skin, and there is no black hair in it, then the priest shall isolate the person with the scaly infection for seven days. And on the seventh day the priest shall look at the infection, and if the scale has not spread and no yellowish hair has grown in it, and the appearance of the scale is no deeper than the skin, then he shall shave himself, but he shall not shave the scale, and the priest shall isolate the person with the scale seven more days. Then on the seventh day the priest shall look at the scale, and if the scale is not spread in the skin, and it appears to be no deeper than the skin, the priest shall pronounce him clean, and he shall wash his clothes and be clean. But if the scale spreads farther in the skin after his cleansing, then the priest shall look at him, and if the scale has spread in the skin, the priest need not seek for the yellowish hair. He is unclean. If in his sight the scale has remained, however, and black hair has grown in it, the scale has healed, he is clean, and the priest shall pronounce him clean. And when a man or woman has bright spots on the skin of the body, even white bright spots, then the priest shall look, and if the bright spots on the skin of their bodies are a faint white, it is eczema that has broken out on the skin. He is unclean. Now if a man loses the hair of his head, he is bald, he is clean. And if his head becomes bald at the front and sides, he is bald on the forehead, he is clean. 
but if on the bald head of the bald or the bald forehead there occurs a reddish white infection, it is leprosy breaking out on the, his bald head or on his bald forehead. Then the priest shall look at him, and if the swelling of the infection is reddish white on his bald head or on his bald forehead, like the appearance of leprosy in the skin of the body, he is a leprous man, he is unclean. The priest shall surely pronounce him unclean, his infection is on his head. As for the leper who has the infection, his clothes shall be torn, and the hair of his head shall be uncovered, and he shall cover his mustache and cry, Unclean! Unclean! He shall remain unclean all the days during which he has the infection. He is unclean. He shall live alone. His dwelling shall be outside the camp. When a garment has a mark of leprosy in it, whether it is a wool garment or a linen garment, whether in warp or woof of linen or of wool, whether in leather or in any article made of leather, if the mark is greenish or reddish in the garment or in the leather or in the warp or in the woof or in any article of leather, it is a leprous mark and shall be shown to the priest. Then the priest shall look on the mark and shall quarantine the article with the mark for seven days. He shall then look at the mark on the seventh day. If the mark has spread in the garment, whether in the warp or in the woof or in the leather, whatever the purpose for which the leather is used, the mark is a leprous malignancy. It is unclean. So he shall burn the garment, whether the warp or the woof, in wool or in linen, or any article of leather in which the mark occurs, for it is a leprous malignancy. It shall be burned in the fire. But if the priest shall look, and indeed the mark is not spread in the garment, either in the warp or in the woof, or in any article of leather, then the priest shall order them to wash the thing in which the mark occurs, and he shall quarantine it for seven more days. After the article with the mark has been washed, the priest shall again look, and if the mark has not changed its appearance, even though the mark has not spread, it is unclean, you shall burn it in the fire, whether an eating away has produced bareness on the top or on the front of it. Then if the priest shall look, and if the mark has faded after it has been washed, then he shall tear it out of the garment or out of the leather, whether from the warp or from the woof. And if it appears again in the garment, whether in the warp or in the woof, or in any article of leather, it is an outbreak. The article with the mark shall be burned in the fire. And the garment, whether the warp or the woof, or any article of leather from which the mark has departed when you washed it, it shall be washed again a second time and shall be clean. This is the law for the mark of leprosy in a garment of wool or linen, whether in the warp or in the woof, or in any article of leather for pronouncing it clean or unclean. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, This shall be the law of the leper in the day of his cleansing. Now he shall be brought to the priest, and the priest shall go out to the outside of the camp. Thus the priest shall look, and if the infection of leprosy has been healed in the leper, then the priest shall give orders to take two live clean birds and cedar wood and a scarlet string and hyssop for the one who is to be cleansed. The priest shall also give orders to slay the one bird in an earthenware vessel over running water, as for the live bird, he shall take it together with the cedar wood and the scarlet string and the hyssop, and shall dip them and the live bird in the blood, in the blood of the bird that was slain over the running water. He shall then sprinkle seven times the one who is to be cleansed from the leprosy, and shall pronounce him clean, and shall let the live bird go free over the open field. The one to be cleansed shall then wash his clothes and shave off all his hair and bathe in water and be clean. Now afterward he may enter the camp, but he shall stay outside his tent for seven days. And it will be on the seventh day that he will shave off all his hair. He shall shave his head and his beard and his eyebrows, even all his hair. He shall then wash his clothes and bathe his body in water and be clean. Now on the eighth day, he is to take two male lambs without defect, and a young yearling ewe lamb without defect, 
and three tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering, and one, fog, one log of oil. And the priest who pronounces him clean shall present the man to be cleansed, and the aforesaid before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. Then the priest shall take the one male lamb and bring it for a guilt offering with the log of oil and present them as a wave offering before the Lord. Next he shall slaughter the male lamb in the place where they slaughter the sin offering and the burnt offering at the place of the sanctuary for the guilt offering. Like the sin offering belongs to the priest. It is most holy. The priest shall then take some of the blood of the guilt offering, and the priest shall put it on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. The priest shall also take some of the log of oil and pour it into his left palm. The priest shall then dip his right hand finger into that oil that is in the left palm, and with his finger sprinkle some of the oil seven times before the Lord. And of the remaining oil which is in his palm, the priest shall put some on the right earlobe of the one to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot, on the blood of the guilt offering. While the rest of the oil that is in the priest's palm he shall put on the head of the one to be cleansed, so the priest shall make atonement on his behalf before the Lord. The priest shall next offer the sin offering and make atonement for the one to be cleansed from his uncleanness. Then afterward he shall slaughter the burnt offering. And the priest shall offer up the burnt offering and the grain offering on the altar. Thus the priest shall make atonement for him, and he shall be clean. But if he is poor and his means are insufficient, then he is to take one male lamb for a guilt offering as, as a wave offering to make atonement for him, and one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil for a grain offering and a log of oil, and two turtle doves, or two young pigeons, which are within his means. The one will be a sin offering, and the other a burnt offering. Then the eighth day he shall bring them for his cleansing to the priest at the doorway of the tent of meeting before the Lord. And the priest shall take the lamb of the guilt offering, and the log of oil, and the priest shall offer them for a wave offering before the Lord. Next he shall slaughter the lamb of the guilt offering, and the priest is to take some of the blood of the guilt offering and put it on the lobe of the right ear of the one to be cleansed, and on the thumb of his right foot, right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot. The priest shall also pour some of the oil into his left palm, and with his right hand finger the priest shall sprinkle some of the oil that is in his left palm seven times before the Lord. The priest shall then put some of the oil that is in the palm of the lobe of his right ear of the one to be cleansed, and on the thumb of the right hand, and on the big toe of his right foot, on the place of the blood of the guilt offering. Moreover, the rest of the oil that is in the priest's palms he shall put on the head of the one to be cleansed, and to make atonement on his behalf before the Lord. He shall then offer one of his turtle doves or young pigeons which are within his means. He shall offer what he can afford, the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering, together with the grain offering. So the priest shall make atonement before the Lord on behalf of the one to be cleansed. This is the law for him in whom there is an infection of leprosy, whose means are limited for his cleansing. The Lord further spoke to Moses and Aaron, saying, When you enter the land of Canaan, which I give you for a possession, and I put a mark of leprosy in the, on a house in the land of your possession, then the one who owns the house shall come and tell the priest, saying, Something like a mark of leprosy has become visible to me in the house. The priest shall then order that they empty the house before the priest goes in to look at the mark, so that everything in the house need not become unclean. And afterward, the priest shall go in to look at the house. So he shall look at the mark. And if the mark on the walls of the house has greenish or reddish depressions and appears deeper than the surface, then the priest shall come out of the house to the doorway and quarantine the house for seven days. And the priest shall return on the seventh day and make an inspection. 
If the mark has indeed spread on the walls of this house, then the priest shall order them to tear out the stones with the mark in them and throw them away at an unclean place outside the city. And he shall have the house scraped all around inside, and they shall dump the plaster that they scrape off at an unclean place outside the city. And then they shall take the other stone, take other stones, and replace those stones, and he, sh and, shall, and he shall take other plaster and replaster the house. If, however, the mark breaks out again in the house after he has torn out the stones and scraped the house, and after it has been replastered, then the priest shall come in and make an inspection. If he sees that the mark has indeed spread in the house, it is a malignant mark in the house, it is unclean. He shall therefore tear down the house, its stones and its timbers, and all the plaster of the house, and he shall take them outside the city to an unclean place. Moreover, whoever goes into the house during the time that he has quarantined it becomes unclean until evening. Likewise, whoever lies down in the house shall wash his clothes, and whoever eats in the house shall wash his clothes. If, on the other hand, the priest comes in and makes an inspection, and the mark is not indeed spread in the house after the house has been replastered, then the priest shall pronounce the house clean, because the mark has not reappeared. To cleanse the house, then, he shall take two birds and cedar wood and a scarlet string and hyssop, and he shall slaughter the one bird in an earthenware vessel over running water, and then he shall take the cedar wood and the hyssop and the scarlet string with the live bird and dip them in the blood of the slain bird as well as in the running water and sprinkle the house seven times. He shall thus cleanse the house with the blood of the bird and with the running water along with the live bird and with the cedar wood and with the hyssop and with the scarlet string. However, he shall let the live bird go free outside the city into an open field. So he shall make atonement for the house and it shall be clean. This is the law for any mark of leprosy, even for a scale, and for the leprous garment or house, and for a swelling, and for a scab, and for a bright spot, to teach when they are unclean and where and when they are clean. Thus is the law of leprosy. The Lord also spoke to Moses and to Aaron, saying, Speak to the sons of Israel and say to them, when any man has a discharge from his body, his discharge is unclean. This, moreover, shall be his uncleanness in his discharge. It is his uncleanness whether his body allows its discharge to flow or whether his body obstructs its discharge. Every bed on which the person with the discharge lies becomes unclean, and everything on which he sits becomes unclean. Anyone, moreover, who touches his bed shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And whoever sits on the thing on which the man with the discharge has been sitting shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Also, whoever touches the person with the discharge shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Or if the man with the discharge spits on one who is clean, he too shall wash his clothes and bathe in the water and be unclean until evening. And every saddle on which the person with the discharge rides becomes unclean. Whoever then touches any of the things which were under him shall be unclean until evening. And he who carries them shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Likewise, whomever the one with the discharge touches without having rinsed his hands in water shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. However, an earthenware vessel which the person with the discharge touches shall be broken, and every wooden vessel shall be rinsed in water. Now when the man with the discharge becomes cleansed from his discharge, then he shall count off for himself seven days for his cleansing. He shall then wash his clothes and bathe his body in running water, and shall become clean. Then on the eighth day he shall take for himself two turtle doves or two young pigeons, and come before the Lord to the doorway of the tent of meeting, and give them to the priest. And the priest shall offer them, one for a sin offering, and the other for a burnt offering. So the priest shall make atonement on his behalf before the Lord because of his discharge. Now if a man has a seminal emission, he shall bathe all his body in water, and be unclean until evening. 
As for any garment or any leather on which there is a seminal emission, it shall be washed with water and be unclean until evening. If a man lies with a woman so that there is a seminal emission, they shall both bathe in water and be unclean until evening. When a woman has a discharge, if her discharge in her body is blood, she shall continue in her menstrual impurity for seven days, and whoever touches her shall be unclean until evening. Everything also on which she lies during her menstrual impurity shall be unclean, and everything on which she sits shall be unclean. And anyone who touches her bed shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. And whoever touches anything on which she sits shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. Whether it be on the bed or on the thing on which she is sitting, when he touches it, he shall be unclean until evening. And if a man actually lies with her so that her menstrual impurity is on him, he shall be unclean seven days, and every bed on which he lies shall be unclean. Now if a woman has a discharge of her blood many days, not at the period of her menstrual impurity, or if she has a discharge beyond that period, all the days of her impure discharge shall she shall continue, she shall continue as though in her menstrual impurity she is unclean. Any bed on which she lies all the days of her discharge shall be to her like bed, like her bed in menstruation, and everything on which she sits shall be unclean, like her uncleanness at that time. Likewise, whoever touches them shall be unclean, and shall wash his clothes and bathe in water and be unclean until evening. When she becomes clean from her discharge, she shall count off for herself seven days, and afterwards she shall be clean. Then on the eighth day she shall take for herself two turtle doves or two young pigeons and bring them in to the priest to the doorway of the tent of meeting. And the priest shall offer the one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. So the priest shall make atonement on her behalf before the Lord because of her unpure discharge. Thus you shall keep the sons of Israel separated from their uncleanness, lest they die in their uncleanness by their defiling my tabernacle that is among them. This is the law for the one with the discharge and for the man who has a seminal emission so that he is unclean, and for the woman who is ill because of menstrual impurity, and for the one who has a discharge, whether a male or female, or a man who lies with an unclean woman. Seeks, but seeks your face. 
Since we've been on our knees, Holy Spirit, come and us some of the study I really want to get to, but Patrick writes devotionals, and I get one every day, and they usually follow the Torah reading in some way, shape, or form, and this year he's working on correlating the apostolic writings with it, and so he's commenting on, on apostolic writings, but he takes it back to Torah every time, and he talked this week in one place about this ceremony. The priest shall order, and we're in Leviticus 14, verse 4, the priest shall order the two live clean birds, some cedar wood, scarlet thread, and hyssop be brought for the one to be cleansed. Okay, two birds, wood, yarn, or thread, and hyssop. Did you think about this for a few minutes? The priest shall order that one of the birds will be killed over the fresh water in a clay pot. So 
There's this clay pot, you take the bird and, you, and, and the bird is, is slaughtered over the pot so his blood drips into the water. It's a mixing of water and blood. Then he takes the live bird and he dips it. Now he's tied to the live bird, he's tied cedar wood, scarlet yarn, and hyssop. Wood, the scarlet thread or yarn, and the hyssop. And he takes this poor bird that is alive and he dips it in the water mixture of water and blood of the other bird. And Patrick talked about when we think about Yeshua and him coming to the earth, And when he was tied to the wood <laughs> and nailed to the wood. And what flew out of his side, what came out of his side when the spear cut him, but water and blood mixture, right? There's water blood mixture. And there's a sense in which Yeshua died, but the life Yeshua comes out of that. And then I loved the way Patrick wrote this, he said, you know, after, after all this, then it's sprinkled, right? And Yeshua sprinkles his blood on the altar in the heavenly places. And when you take this bird outside the city and you let it go, where does it do? It's very happy to leave, right? It flies free from all these symbols of death. That in this process of cleansing, the priest takes things that are symbols of death and releases them in life with this live bird. But those are interesting. But I still don't understand the basic concept of clean and unclean. And there's, there's other places I go to study, and then one of them is called the Rabbi's Son. And, and um, if you want a link to it, let me know. I'd be happy to send it to you. Because he writes these beautiful things, and, and the way he writes it makes it understandable. And he talks about this part of scripture. One of the things he mentions is that in these two readings, we have this phrase, the Lord said to Moses. The Lord said to Moses. And I, I know a lot of believers that have what they call red letter New Testaments, and they think that they, they read it in such a way that, you know, the direct words of Yeshua are in red letter. They're highlighted so we can really know what the direct words of him are. And in a sense, we could look at this passage as being red letter Torah. The Lord said, the Lord said. Now, this is not Moses' interpretation of what the Lord said. These are specific instructions the Lord is giving. Just like when Yeshua taught on the mountain, those were specific instructions that he gave. There's no explanation for it. It's here's the mount, here's the discourse, here's what he said, and we call it the Beatitudes and all of that. Well, here's the Lord said, direct. And we look at it and go, oh, well, that's all Old Testament stuff. I don't have to worry about it. That's what I've been told. Then we go to the Brit Hadassah with the Apostolic Writings. And I'm just going to give you some places, some places where it says unclean, uses the phrase unclean, which is the same concept as what is used through here, the unclean one, the unclean. Um, in Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 6, 17 through 7, 1, in fact, I'm just going to read that part to you. This is one of many places. 2 Corinthians 6. 17. Well, actually, I want to go before that because I always do that. I like reading, you know, 20, 20, 20 verses before 20 after. I'm not going to do that this time, but I will go back a little bit before. Um, verse 16 says, What agreement is there between the temple of God and idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God has said, I will live with them and will walk with them and I will be their God and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from them and be separate, says the Lord. And this is quoting right from Torah. Touch no unclean thing and I will receive you. I will be a father to you. You will be my sons and daughters, says the Lord Almighty. Since we have this promise, dear friends, 
Let us purify ourselves from everything that contaminates body and spirit, perfecting holiness out of reverence for God. What do we think he's talking about? Clean and unclean. Let's purify ourselves, brothers. Let's be what he's called us to be. I'm just going to read off some verses, and, and you can write them down. You can look them up later. I'm not going to read them all. I'm going to read you the references. Romans 1, 18 through 24, it talks about the unclean. 2 Corinthians 6, 17 through 7, one I just read. 2 Corinthians 12, 20 through 21, it talks about the unclean not entering the kingdom. Ephesians 5, 3, 3 and 7. Ephesians 4, 17 through 19. Galatians 5, 19 through 21. Colossians 3, 5 and 6. And there are more. In Colossians 3, 5 and 6, 6 Shaul or Paul told the Colossians, Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. Because of these things, the wrath of God comes against the sons of disobedience. Now, I've heard all kinds of preachers talk about the fornication, about the earthly passion, about evil desire, and covetry, covetousness. I've heard them talk about idolatry. I've never heard anyone directly talk about what is unclean and why we stay away from it. But it's talked about. It's there. It's all over the place. When Yeshua walked the earth, one of the things that he did was he cast out spirits, right, that were not of God. And there are different kinds of spirits he cast out, by the way. If you look it up, I, I was just looking that up earlier this morning because this is one of those things God just kind of went, whoa, wait a minute, unclean spirits. You know, we think about evil spirits, familiar spirits, the spirit of God. We think about all these other things. But there's also unclean spirits, okay? Well, how do we get unclean spirits? Well, maybe it's because we don't clean ourselves. I don't know. I'm just beginning to understand. I'm just looking at it. But there are things that the priesthood, and he says we are a royal priesthood, are supposed to be able to distinguish, and we need to be learning them, I believe. And part is the holy and the common. The Kadesh, which is conceived of God. The fire that came from heaven was conceived of God. The common, something that is man-conceived, man-generated, man-focused, and pleasing to men. Like the fire that Aaron's sons offered. It was a strange fire. It wasn't God's fire. It was a common fire. There's nothing wrong with the common, okay? I want to understand that. When God gives us good ideas, there's nothing wrong with that. But there are God ideas and good ideas, and we need to learn to distinguish between the two so we know when and how to function. These things are supposed to balance out in our lives. There's nothing wrong, by the way, with being unclean, necessarily. In fact, there's something right about some types of uncleanness. There is the uncleanness that they believe that that infectious, in, in my translation it's called mildew, in the translation that Craig was reading it's called spots. I've, I've seen it read as mildew or mold. Um, it's something that grows on a house, something that can grow on a person. It's considered contaminated. The rabbis believe that comes from a sin called Lashon Hara, which is evil tongue, evil speech. We get that because when Miriam spoke against Moses, what was she struck with? The leprosy. We translate it as leprosy. But it's not the same type of leprosy that, are, that we treat today medically. It's not the same thing. Some rabbis will tell you that this sort of thing only happened in the Promised Land. In the land of Israel, it's the only place you'll see this on the houses and walls. I, I don't know. I just, that's what they teach. I do know that it's not the disease leprosy that we talk about today or that, that is treated in the colonies or treated medically. It's something that's different. It's an uncleanness. 
Maybe some of it does come from improper speech. And if that's the case, we really need to look at our tongues and what we say about each other and around each other and to each other. But some uncleanness just comes from normal life. You know? When a woman has a baby, this is a good thing. It's a fulfillment of a command. It's a mitzvah. It's doing what God's told us to do. But it's also part of normal life. How does that make us unclean if uncleanness is directly related to sin? It's not. Unclean means that which is coming from within, that which comes from man. When Yeshua talked about it, when his disciples were criticized for eating the grain with unwashed hands, Yeshua said that that which we do isn't what makes us unclean. It's that which comes out of us that makes us unclean. Okay, that's an interesting concept. Well, what comes out of us? Well, think about what we've been reading and what they say, the negative, critical, wounding words that comes forth from our mouth. Conception of a child, that's something that comes forth out of the human body. Menstrual flow comes forth out of the body. Seminal discharge of a man comes out of a man. Fluid, blood, baby, placenta, all of this comes out. Any unusual discharge, it's coming out of the body. So that which comes out of the body, which is related to the earthly realm, because it's coming out of our physical bodies, is unclean. That's not sin, but it's unclean. The realm of Tameh, and if I can understand this at all right, the Tameh and the Tohor, the Tameh, that which makes us unclean or is unclean, is associated with something that brings fragmentation and breeds of death. There's a death related to it. There's something about death that's related to it. The Tohor is associated with that which brings healing, the clean. The Tahor is clean. That which brings healing, restoration, wholeness, and includes nurturing, the nurturing in life. The Mishkin is the place where the Holy Spirit dwells. That which is related to death cannot come into the presence of God. All these things which come forth out of our bodies are related to the physical body, which is related to physical death. We die. We're human. That cannot come before a holy and righteous God who is life. Any more than evil can stand in the presence of a holy and righteous God who is good. Evil is the absence of good. Death is the absence of life. These things which come from our body are a part of the absence of life. It's the shedding of life. It's the, it, it, and I, I don't know how else to explain it. I know growing up that as I read some of these Old Testament passages, I got a concept that was not godly. Got a concept that as a woman, I was unclean more than a man. Therefore, there, that, there's something wrong with me. <laughs> with the giftings that God has given me that I've known about early on, I, you know, I was told when I was a little girl, if you kiss your elbow, you'll turn into a boy. I, I don't know how many times I hurt my arm trying to kiss my elbow because I knew God's call. And in the church I grew up with, women didn't preach. <laughs> a woman could teach Sunday school, but that, and I did a lot of that. Um, I grew, I did a lot of that. I remember my mother, my, my mom and dad, and my dad pastoring the church, and my mother always taught an adult Sunday school class. And dad, they, they were criticized for that, but my mother was a teacher. And she was a good teacher. She was not a teacher of children. That wasn't her calling. And there were people in the congregation who got upset. And here was the response that the church always had. Well, you can either go to Donna's class or you can go to John's class. If you're not okay with a woman teaching you, you have a choice. Go to John's. And he was a phenomenal teacher too. So there was always a balance. Someone here, someone. But there were people who recognized my mother's gifting. She was limited in her generation and in that church by what she was allowed to do. Remember my dad getting in trouble because he had a missionary that came 
to visit a woman missionary, and in that day and age, women you know, were, were allowed to be missionaries, and we were allowed to preach in other countries, but not here. And my dad let her preach in the morning service, and he got in trouble with the state conference because, well, it's okay to have a woman teach in Sunday night service and talk about what the mission field is, but, but that's not what she did. She preached. My dad went, hey, if she can preach on the mission field, she can preach to us. There were things I grew up with, but I still looked at this and I went, what? I don't get it. It's not that a woman is more unclean than a man. However, even in Judaism, there's a recognition that women have more practical, hands-on things we have to do in this realm, in the natural world, to sustain life. The cooking, the cleaning, the babies, the, all of this stuff are things, and they're not time-constricted. The baby cries when the baby cries. You have to take care of the baby. You can't set a timer on a child. <laughs> People try. People have tried. But you can't do that. And so women in Judaism are excluded from the requirements of the daily prayers. We're invited to participate where we can, but we're excluded from the requirement because, you know, we deal with everyday life that is not... You can't relegate to time. It's got to be done. When the baby cries, you got to feed the baby. Simple as that. You can set up your cattle to be milked at a certain time of day and they'll get used to it. <laughs> I don't understand all of that. What I do know is that all of us, every human being, male, female, we all come in contact with that which is unclean. It's a normal part of the human existence. God created us to go through this. Does that mean he's going to turn his back on us when we're in an unclean position? No, that's not what it means. The rabbis believe that most of the stuff on unclean and clean have to do with coming into the tabernacle. It's ritual cleanness versus cleanness being unclean ritually. So you can't come into the tabernacle. You can't come into the temple. Since there's no temple, no tabernacle, some of these things are not really con concerned with today. Brit says we're supposed to stay clean. Now, I'm not saying we're supposed to take a couple birds and dip them in blood, you know. I'm not telling, please don't take this and say what I'm not saying. I'm not saying the sacrificial system needs to be done. I am not saying we need to bring a couple birds in here, tie one up, slaughter the I'm not saying that. I believe that Yeshua fulfilled these sacrifices. And until such time as there is a priesthood reestablished that Yeshua reestablishes, I don't think we're supposed to do that. But we do, on a daily basis, need to come before God and be cleansed by the blood of the Lamb that was shed for our sins and for us and for the fact that we are human. We're supposed to do that. We're not supposed to just brush it off and say that doesn't happen today, that's not about today. I think we need to begin to understand it. One of the things that was written in this that the rabbi's son wrote about, and I think I've ordered these wrong somehow, is that when we talk about the, the tame and the tahor, and we talk about that which makes us unclean, we have come in contact, when we are unclean, we've come in contact with something, with a life circumstance. We've had something happen to us or something in that's a potential to disturb and to threaten our wholeness, our cleanness, our stand before God. Sometimes it's something that just is distracting. Having a baby can be very distracting from your prayer time. I know that one. <laughs> It can also be used as something that draws us closer to God. So it's one way or the other. We can choose one way or the other. There's other things that there's things that about the world that distract us. There's things about life circumstance that distract us, that take our attention and our focus off of our relationship with God. And there's sometimes not something wrong with that as much as that we have a choice then. What do I do with that which distracts me? Am I going to recognize this as a potential? Am I going to recognize it for what it is? And am I going to say, okay, 
this has the potential to take me away from God. God has steps for me to stay close to him and to come back in contact with him and to be put back into that place of fellowship, of cleanness with him. We have that opportunity every day, all day long, when normal things happen, when normal things don't happen. There are consequences to life. And there's nothing wrong with those consequences necessarily. I grew up thinking that was dirty, it was ugly, it was awful. And making things that, that God has defined as, 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 that he's given us, and I felt it was dirty. Because we, const we think of clean and unclean as being something that's, that's clean or dirty, right? Well, that's not what this is talking about. It's not talking about physical dirty. It's talking about something that is, is, is different from that. Becoming Tame is not the end of the world. You're not unclean for, for, for forever when there's a place to be clean, when there's a way to clean. You notice there's places that says he's unclean until evening, or he's a, he shall wash, and he's unclean until this. And there's a time limit to it. It's not forever. It's not an awful thing. It's a normal life experience. We have a choice. Am I going to move closer to God with my normal life experiences, or am I going to move away from God because of normal life experiences? Do I come to the Lamb? Do I come to this place and recognize that the sacrifices have been made? Do I look for the pictures of Yeshua in all of this? Do I claim that? Do I work with that? Do I do my part in that? I don't know. If you do, you know, I'm beginning to figure it out. I, I still don't understand it. I still don't grasp this concept. I'm, I mean, I feel like I've just put my toe in the water. <laughs> just beginning to put my toe in the water of this going... Huh. And I am so grateful for something that God show, things that God shows me on a regular basis. Like, did you know in, this, in these two passages that we read together, it says, the Lord said to Moses five times. Five times. And the Lord reminded me the number five, when it's used in scripture, it usually relates to grace, the grace of God, the grace of God, the grace of God. I am so thankful for the grace of God. <laughs> I am so thankful for the grace of God because there's so much we don't know. And God's grace is so sufficient that he takes what we don't know. And he loves us. And he provides for us. And he brings us into a place where we can learn. That's why study is so important. That's why individual study is important. It isn't about what I teach or what Patrick teaches me or what, what the rabbi's son that I've that I been reading from, what he teaches. It's not about what a human being teaches. It's about, can I take this to the throne of God? Can I understand it? Can I study it? Because each one of us should be studying it ourselves. Don't ever take something I say and go, oh, well, that's, she said that, so that's the way it is. Don't say that. Go back to the word. Read it, look it up, figure it out for yourself. Take what I teach and make, let that be just a jumping off point for you to study, to learn, to find out, to center ourselves on God. Today's the first Shabbat of the month of Ayar, <laughs> the month that is between the month of Passover and the month of Shavuot. Passover, redemption, Shavuot, the giving of the Spirit, the giving of the Word. We're in an in-between month. It's also represented by the tribe of Issachar. I found it interesting that Deborah is from the tribe of Issachar. <laughs> oh, hey, that's kind of cool. The Judge Deborah. God raised her up at a time when there was no leadership in Israel. As a judge in Israel, God gave her words, and she spoke them to certain people. And I, I, 
I love Deborah because she said and she did what she was supposed to do. And when she told someone to go do something, and he went, I'm not doing it without you, she went, okay, fine, but the glory is now going to go to a woman. <laughs> I think God has a sense of humor sometimes in what he does. And Deborah walked with an anointing over Israel and taught them, but she never once it doesn't show her as being outside of her position as a mother in Israel. That's what I feel the Lord is trying to teach me to become more as a mother in Israel. I don't know how that's going to go. I don't, I don't understand it yet. But if what I do is provoke you to study it yourself, then I've done good. If what we do here just provokes you to go, huh, why did they do that and why did they do that and whatever, and provokes you to study it for yourself and determine between you and God what you're supposed to be doing, then we've done something. Because it's not about pointing back at us. It's not about pointing back at me. It's about, can we bring you to that place? <laughs> and saying, Father, we love you. Yeshua, we love you. It's coming back to that place. When Yeshua did many of his miracles, there was a place where he told a woman, I forgot, you know, he forgave sins and they were healed. There's another place where he asked someone, do you want to be clean? And they said, yes. And he said, you are clean. When he cleansed the lepers, he sent them back to the temple to go through the process of cleansing. He did not take away from that. He can clean us from what is unclean. He makes us holy. We're not holy because of our good deeds. We're holy because he makes us holy. So we walk holy. I'm not clean because of myself. We're clean because of because Yeshua makes us clean. So let's study it out. I challenge you to look it up this week. <laughs> look up where the Bible talks about clean or unclean. Find out what it says. And then ask, Lord, what do I do with this now? Like I said, I'm just beginning. We're beginners. <sighs> Abba Father, you're my Father. You're my God, and I choose to serve you, and I thank you for who you are. I thank you that you've chosen me. <laughs> Your word says that you've chosen the weak things <laughs> and the foolish. <laughs> and I feel very foolish some days. And I know I'm very weak at times but I thank you. Thank you for what you're teaching me, for what you're teaching us. Thank you for the challenge you give us. Thank you for raising us up. Father, I ask for those that are not able to be here today that, God, you would bless them. For those that, that visit us by the, the repeated, the website stuff, the recordings, Father, bless them. Father, bless. And we cry out for you to begin to teach your people what you need us to know. Your word says that Yeshua will come back as a conquering king. And Father, it says that you're going to come back for a spotless bride. So teach us what it will take, and what we need to do to be that spotless bride. Without spot or wrinkle, without a spot of leprosy, without any of the mildew, without any of those things, clean and holy before you. Teach us, Father. Thank you for what you're doing and for the challenge. In the name of Yeshua HaMashiach.